check, check. All right. How are we doing today? All right. Good. So, uh, small crowd, which is good, right? It's more hamachi for everybody else. Okay. So, we're going to do a fun um, little dish. Uh, we have some uh, big special for you guys tonight, actually. Um, so, you guys had Yellowtail at sushi restaurants before, right? Anybody? Yellowtail, right? Yellowtail, hamachi. Uh, it's in the Jack family, right? Very, very strong, aggressive fish, um, shaped like a bullet. And I'll show you here in a sec once I get another glove on. Um, but yeah, I just moved out here from Chicago. I'm originally from New York City. Uh, I've had the, uh, I've had the really, I've been really lucky to work in eight countries outside of the United States. Um, you know, I've opened restaurants in Hong Kong and Singapore and Panama. Uh, I've worked in France. I've consulted for the Four Seasons in Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, I've worked in Rio de Janeiro, I've worked in Costa Rica, uh, so I've been really, really lucky uh, to have these opportunities, and I like to be able to do demos when I do them, do them real time, right? Because it's so easy to talk about something, like, oh, through the magic of TV, here we go, right? So, we got this whole fish in today, right? This come from Japan, okay? This is not the fake stuff that you would see in a, in a, in a subpar sushi restaurant. Uh, sometimes you'll see, um, you know, that it's very pink flesh, right? Beware of pink flesh fish in a sushi restaurant, okay? Typically, it's not the real deal, okay? Nothing is really pink, you know? There's snappers that kind of swim uh, in, the, in, the, in the Pacific uh, that, that can be pink, but generally, that's a dye that's added to the fish in order to make it look good, okay? And it's probably very bad for you. I'm not quite sure the science on it, but I know dye generally shouldn't be ingested, okay? So we're going to do this real time today, right? Which is going to be a lot of stress for me, but we'll get it done. So I just sharpened my knife. Hopefully I won't go to the hospital with it, right? All right. So we have a fine, kind of coarse one, right? And when your knife's very sharp, you have a polished steel, okay? It's called a dick polish is the name of it. No comments, please. Okay. Yeah, it's Sunday, guys. I'm working on my day off. Come on, let's have some fun. All right. So we do a couple of cuts, right? You see how the fish is shaped, right? Okay, so I'm going to come through the back. I always put my towel on top here, right? We're going to come through the back. Long strokes. Okay, big long strokes. When you do fish, if you fillet fish at home, you don't want to saw at it, right? Sharp knife, big long strokes, okay? So now flip it over on the other side. You see, it goes all the way down. Okay? Yeah, flip it. Yeah, it's, it's a $600 knife, yeah. But <laughs> I've had it for 10 years. So if you guys invest in good knives, and it's light as a feather. This thing weighs about five ounces, 150 grams. 150 grams. I get these from a company called Corin in New York City. Uh, very, very famous. Corin with a K. K-O-R-I-N. Look it up on the web. You can spend $20,000 in a knife if you want. Okay? So then I come through the back here like that. Okay? And right through like that. Okay? And I'm going to flip it over. And I'm going to do the same thing on this side. Okay? Ooh, got my knife good today. It's nice and sharp. Okay? So you want to go through here, and again, just touch to that backbone there, okay? Now, for my next cut, right, we're going to pick up this tail here, and my knife is so sharp, it's just going to go right through the bones, okay? And that just comes right off like that, okay? So then when we have one side here, okay? And I'll put this right here for now, okay? Now, on the other side, what we're going to do is that we're going to do the same thing, Right? Kind of come right through and it just comes right off. Right? Okay? Pretty quick. Takes uh, a little bit of practice. I'm going to move my garbage a little closer here. Okay? So pretty quick, right? You guys can do that at home, no? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Next trick, okay? The collar is right here, right? You want to take that off? Okay? If you go to these good Japanese restaurants, sometimes they serve that. You'll see that in the soup. Right, you see that in a soup, you see it grilled, sometimes lacquered with uh, soy sauce and honey, so it gets really brown. But for today, sadly, we're just going to throw it away. Okay? Then over here, you have these rib bones, right? All these rib bones, push forward with a knife, and then pull back, and that comes right off. Okay? Pretty easy, right? Then we have this belly piece here and this top loin here, right? And then you have a bone structure that goes all the way down the middle. Okay, so what we're going to do... Take that bone structure out, one cut, right? Next one, one cut, right? Two cuts, and that comes off, okay? 
Good, we're having fun. I like it. You guys drinking or what? <laughs> I figured as much. Everybody's laughing at the fish. All right. <laughs> All right. So for me, I like to square it off, right? That piece I always take for myself. Okay. Then to zig the skin, right? So we come like this, you come down, right? Knife's under the skin, pull it, okay? Just like that, okay? Yeah, I've got a few hamachis in my life, a few hamachis, a few thousand maybe, okay? And again, right like this, okay? Again, down, under, right? And we'll see if we can get it, yep, pull right off, okay? Just like that, all right? So, nice, right? Quick, huh? We like to have fun with these, right? I love cutting hamachi. It's one of my favorite things, okay? So again, right? Slap it down. Collar off. That goes in the garbage, sadly. Flip it over. Take it down like that. The rib, cut, done, okay? Then our next cut, go down like that, okay? Cut, done, done, cut. We only got a half an hour. We got to move, okay? Usually get two or three hours for a demo, okay? Half an hour, we got to fly, all right? Done. Like that, with a towel, run, flip, that, okay? Put this over here for slicing in a minute. Go through here, down, again, okay? Flip, okay, done. All right. So, what you see here, and, uh, we have, all right, we're eight minutes in, all right? So now, you see this gray skin here? Okay, this is very, very highly regarded in Japanese restaurants, right? This is the fat in between the skin and the flesh, okay? And good Japanese restaurants, like this here, okay, this white part, this is really considered a delicacy. It's one of my favorite parts. It took me a long time to figure out how to do this. What you have to do, and this is super advanced, but when you skin it like that, right, you have to hold your knife at a straight, like at just a very faint angle, so it digs into the skin. When you pull it back, you push forward like, oh, my knife's sharp. I go like that, push forward, and I'll get that, uh, that layer of fat right in, okay? So now we gotta go to the slicing, right? So again, long strokes, all right? Let's polish it up real quick. All right, bloodline. What do you guys feel about the bloodline? Americans like it? No, Americans hate the bloodline, all right? Japanese, yes, uh, and uh, a few uh, other cultures because what happens is that it determines the freshness of the fish, right? If the bloodline is gray, the fish is old. If the bloodline is bright red, the fish is fresh, okay? So I leave a little bit of the bloodline on. I'll show you, I leave a racing stripe right down the middle of it, I'll show you what I mean, okay? So again, kind of coming back, using the whole length of my knife, all the way down, okay? All the way down, okay? That comes off, bloodline, gone, okay? Oh, I cut off my racing stripe, maybe next time. Okay, and then we come down like that, okay? Three cuts and we cleaned it, not bad, right? Okay. Belly, same piece here, okay? Again, with the butt of my knife, using the whole length of the blade all the way down, not sawing at it. Very, very important not to saw at it. I'm gonna leave a little bit of the bloodline on here, and that's always for me. Okay? Take that. Next one, here. Come, all the way down, okay? Let's see if we can get the racing stripe this time. Okay, so very, very thin line, right? Pull it back. Pull it back with your fingers, right? So you're just taking a sheet off of a rounded piece of fish. Not the easiest thing to do, okay? And that's where we end up with our racing stripe, okay? Good. Next one, coming down again. Using the length of the knife, okay? Super sharp, I don't wanna cut myself with this. I'll definitely go to the hospital on my day off. Okay, it'll be a clean cut at least, all right? <laughs> Good, we're having fun so far, I hope, right? Everybody ready for some raw fish, I hope, too, yeah? Hey, Aaron, how you doing? How you guys doing, all right? Good. All right, so now what we're gonna do in the next four minutes is that we're gonna slice this entire fish. Let's see if we can pull it off, all right? So I got some parchment paper here. Uh, and again, I'm not a sushi chef, right? I'm not a sushi chef. I don't know anything about the art of sushi, uh, but I do have a decent knife stroke when it comes to slicing fish. Decent, decent, that could definitely be worked on. Uh, we have some water around here, I think, right? Yeah. So what I've noticed sitting at a lot of, uh, you know, sushi counters in New York City, watching those guys slice fish, right, is that they always have a wet towel next to their cutting board, right? And why the wet towel? Right, the wet towel is to reduce 
the amount of matter. You see there's a little like matter on that the knife, right? A little bit of flesh right there. Wipe that off. That's going to continue to 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 make drag when you slice your slice your fish. Okay? So I'll show you what I mean. Again, nice long strokes starting with the back and then moving, okay? And you slice it and you move it, okay? So I guess I should promote the restaurant and the hotel a little bit, I guess, no? Anybody uh, been to the new uh, uh, Kimpton in Palm Springs yet? Yeah, okay. Good, good. Uh, food's okay. Uh, it's just <laughs> Hotel's beautiful, food's okay. <laughs> no, food's pretty good. All right, food's pretty good. All right, food's pretty good. All right, uh, yeah, so we, we just opened up November 17th, right? Uh, so we have a couple restaurants. We have Juniper Table downstairs, uh, which is a Mediterranean-inspired um, kind of cafe. Uh, you know, we do some, uh, some interesting takes on some, uh, some Mediterranean classics. Um, not the most, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a very kind of uh, stuffy environment, right? And none of the hotel is really stuffy. But uh, it's more of a casual setting. We have a nice outdoor area. Um, and uh, we're open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner there. So that's basically for hotel guests and anybody wanting to grab a, a great cup of coffee and a croissant, right? So upstairs in the rooftop, we have Four Saints. Anybody been to Four Saints? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, it's a beautiful space up there. It's on the seventh floor. Um, you know, we are looking maybe to open up for a, uh, a tea service once the royal wedding rolls around, which would be kind of cool. I think a high tea in Palm Springs would be kind of fun. I used to do one at the Four Seasons in Chicago, uh, and that's pretty cool. So what we do on the rooftop is that we really focus on high, high quality ingredients, right? So we'll bring in sea urchin from Santa Barbara. We'll bring in John Dory, which is a fish that comes out of New Zealand. I'm flying in white asparagus now from France for one of our salads. Uh, we have uh, foie gras that comes from Hudson Valley in New York. Uh, we are using venison that comes from New Zealand. We're using Colorado lamb. So again, not the cheapest restaurant around, but you will not find better product quality in this valley, I guarantee you, okay? Uh, so that's why, you know, people will say, oh, I love it, but it's a little pricey, but that's, you get what you pay for these days, you know? And uh, the cost of food is shooting through the roof. As everybody knows, uh, you know, you go through to the supermarket and you pay a lot bit more, and that all translates down to restaurants. So uh, that's pretty much it. I grew up in Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, uh, and then my parents moved to New Rochelle, uh, which is in Westchester in New York, uh, just outside of New York City. N New York City, yes. Uh, and then uh, we moved to Connecticut. I was terrible at school, so I left, I left school at uh, 17, and uh, I got a job in a butcher shop. My grandfather had a butcher shop in Brooklyn that I worked at. Uh, and then uh, I got another job in a butcher shop in Connecticut, decided that that wasn't really for me. Moved out to Colorado, did the hippie thing for a couple years. You know, I think everybody has to do that at one point in their life. And then I was like, you know what, I'm getting sick of this. I'm going to go back to New York City and get a real job. Uh, my real job, my first real job I got in New York City, I was so lucky to meet uh, a member of arguably one of the most famous restaurant families in all of France, which is Trois Gros. Trois Gros in Rouen, France. I don't know if you guys know about them, T-R-O-I-S-G-R-O-S. -O -S. Um, if you guys see the Netflix series Chef's Table France, his brother's on there. Uh, it's just a legacy of, uh, of people that have been, uh, that, that they've, they've had three Michelin stars now for 35 years, I think. He was trained by the late Paul Bocuse, uh, Roger Verger, all those guys. I mean, super, super classic. I got a chance to meet him. 9-11 happened, the restaurant crashed. He took me down to Miami to go work at the Delano Hotel. Uh, it's a beautiful hotel. I don't know if you guys have been down there. It's like really, it's a that's a timeless hotel. That place is going to be popular forever, forever. Uh, and then uh, he invited me to go down and work with him in Rio de Janeiro. So I was down. I went down with him five times down there, which is where he's based out of. Um, he passed me on to Laurent Tornel. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember the BLT group out of New York City, Bistro Laurent Tornel, BLT Steak, BLT Fish, uh, BLT Market, and the Ritz Carlton in Central Park South. Uh, he also had a restaurant called Cello, which was very famous in New York City before that. Um, you know, Claude was the really nice, endearing father, and Laurent was like the mean uncle. So, you know, I get the best of both worlds in the French side. I got the really, really nice guy who really, you know, took care of me. Laurent took care of me too, but he really beat me. Uh, <laughs> but took me all over the world at the same time. Took me to Singapore, took me to Hong Kong, took me to Panama, um, you know, set me up. Uh, with other jobs down the line too. So I was really, really lucky to get hooked up with these guys. 
you know, depending on how, how hard they worked me or not, I was really lucky to have that opportunity, you know, to know what it takes to open up a successful restaurant is really, really important. I opened up nine restaurants for Laurent in three years. Each restaurant opening is three months apiece. Uh, you can guess what happened in my personal life. <laughs> so, you know, every day you wake up. And when I wasn't traveling, uh, when I wasn't opening restaurants, my region was, I had one restaurant in New York, two restaurants in New York, one restaurant in Westchester, one restaurant in Washington, D.C., one restaurant in Miami, one restaurant in Puerto Rico, one restaurant in Scottsdale, and then the Hong Kong property. So I was always moving. So on my days off or my time away, not opening a restaurant, working 90 hours a week, I was getting to create my own schedule at age 30 to fly all over the world and to take care of the restaurants. I was like, oh, chef, I hear, I hear bad things about Puerto Rico. I should probably go down. You know, so it's like you got to stay at the Ritz-Carlton uh, right on San Juan on the beach. Uh, you know, so I was always complaining about San Juan and how terrible it was and how much help they needed. But, you know, he eventually caught on and I got in trouble, but that's fine. All right. So we have our hamachi sliced. Right, where we at? All right, we got 11 minutes. We'll see if we can pull this off. All right, anybody ever seen fresh garbanzo beans before? You've seen chickpeas before in the store, right? These are fresh, okay? They come out for about four weeks a year, okay? Uh, and they're a real pain in the butt to clean, <laughs> all right? So it's just a little tiny pod. You split them in half, and then it comes out like that, okay? A little guy like that, okay? You only get one per shell. That's crazy, right? One per shell. We got a box in like yesterday, like, like that of these things. Everybody wanted to kill me. Um, but they're super, super cool. Uh, they have a great flavor. And we'll see if we can put together this apple vinaigrette really quick, okay? So what we're going to do for this green apple vinaigrette, uh, you know, apple can be very seasonal, right? Everybody thinks of apple pies and things like that, Thanksgiving time, uh, what have you, right? But for me, green apple is a year-round ingredient. The reason why I love green apple so much is the acidity that comes with it, right? The acidity and the astringentness of the, um, of, of the skin, right? It's really the skin that has a lot of the flavor in the green apple, you know? So we're just gonna take this, slice it pretty thin, okay? And then we're just gonna give this a fine dice, okay? Uh, I should probably get a knife out, huh? I'm sorry? Uh, I was just, uh, I was in charge of, uh, one of the restaurants I took care of was the BLT steak uh, in the Ritz Carlton in San Juan. Yeah, yeah, so that, Oh, come on, that's not even a question? My grandfather would roll over in his grave if I said Red Sox. Red Sox. Uh -huh. Red Sox, all right. I haven't paid attention to baseball in a while, but always going to be Yankees no matter what. <laughs> so, yep, so we're going to take these, right? We put them in the mandolin. Does anybody have a mandolin at home or no? Yeah, anybody cut themselves with those things before? Uh, it's brutal. So, yeah, be careful, right? Especially the ones with the Julienne blades, right? It's like 14 cuts at once. <laughs> right? So what we're going to do with this, right, we're just going to dice it, right? If you're doing it at home, right, I really focus on the guys to make sure all the knife cuts are even. But if you're doing it at home and friends, if you cut apples this small, people are definitely going to be impressed no matter what, okay? It doesn't really, really matter if they're perfect or not, right? So we're going to take all these, you're going to put them in there, right? And then what we're going to do next is that we're going to coat them with lime juice, okay? for two reasons, right? Number one, right? They're not gonna oxidize, right? They won't turn brown. Number two, since this is an emulsified vinaigrette, it's together, right? What we're gonna do is that the, the lime juice and a little bit of salt that I'm gonna put in now, it's gonna draw the water out of the apples, right? Because if you salt the apples after the vinaigrette is already made, it's gonna break it because all the water is gonna come out of it. So you have to make sure to do that beforehand, okay? So I think that's enough for a little vinaigrette here. I have some in the back anyway. I'm making a mess all over the stage. All right. And then juicing limes, right? Not the easiest thing to do in the world. They're so hard, right? So what do I do? I'll roll it like that, okay? Just soften it up a little bit, okay? If you don't have an electric juicer at home or a reamer or whatever it may be. I don't even know if people you still use reamers anymore. Um, so you take that, right? Kind of roll it with the back of your hand like that, okay? And then one of the tr first tricks I ever learned from a cookbook was John George cooking at home with a four-star chef, right? So what he did with the lime, he didn't cut it in half and try to squeeze it. What you do is that you take off the outsides, right? And then there's no hard center part to get in the way. So when you squeeze it, you get all of it, right? I mean, that was like done in like the 1980s, that book, right? So that's a pretty cool, 
pretty cool trick. You can use that for everything. You can use that for grapefruit. You can use that for lemons. You can use it for lime. You can use it for yuzu, yuzu or sudachi or whatever kind of crazy citrus you got laying around here in California. A lot of great citrus out here. Man, I'm blown away from the farmer's markets and everything else. I mean, you know, you have passion fruit and mango and guava and Meyer lemons, the grapefruits out here. Oh, my God. Mellow gold. Anybody had a mellow gold grapefruit before? Go to your farmer's market and get one, okay? <laughs> they are amazing, okay? So then we have a little bit of lime juice, right? We have our salt in the apples, right? And what's happening right now is that the water is leaking out of the apples a little bit, right? Number one, because of the lime juice, but mostly because of the salt, right? So I'm going to take all that. That's going to go in. Uh, I never got my, uh, my microplane, but normally I would put a little bit of lime zest in there too. That's really going to bring up the, the flavor of the lime, right? So then we have our whisk, right? So we have a lot of sour stuff in there right now, right? We have lime, we have apple, right? A little bit of salt. We're going to add a little bit of honey. Okay. You guys have the recipe card, right? Okay, good. I don't remember what it is, but hopefully it's the same thing. <laughs> I think I sent it out like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. So hopefully it all matches up, okay? So then you have a little bit of honey, right? You have the lime. What I'm going to add in there is just a little bit of toasted crushed coriander. Okay, not the ground coriander uh, seed, like, this, like the powder that you get in, your, in your, you know, your supermarket, but the coriander seed. So you just lightly toast it and then crush it with the back of a spoon, and that way it's going to give a little bit of texture, a little bit of crunch, right? So you have the honey, you have the coriander, you have the lime, you have the apples. Uh, I'm going to throw some of these garbanzo beans in here that have been blanched, okay? And they're just thrown in there to make it a little bit more springy. All right? And then... What I'm going to do afterwards is that normally I would put a little bit of mustard oil. You can get that from um, uh, like a, a Middle Eastern store. If you have any around here, I doubt it. But uh, mustard oil, mustard oil has, um, it's used for massage really, you know. But you can use it for eating, but just a little bit at a time, okay. Mustard oil, you'll see that a lot in, uh, in uh, Middle East cooking. And like I said too, they also use that for massage, okay. And then another treat beyond the hamachi today. Right, what we have. So the vinaigrette's made at this point, right? I'm going to give it a quick taste like I always need to. And you see where you're at. Right? It's actually not bad for throwing together so quickly. Right? A little touch of salt. And then we need a little herb in there just to finish it up, right? So what we're going to do, I've got another something special for you. Something, again, talking about the product we use in Four Saints. Is uh, sorrel. Wild wood sorrel. Okay? Do you guys know sorrel? Not a very popular herb, you know, here in the States. Um, my uh, ex-mentor, uh, Claude, his dad uh, and his uncle were famous for a sauce, a uh, sorrel sauce. It was a salmon and sorrel sauce. Very, very famous dish if you look it up. Salmon and sorrel, foie gras. Very, very famous dish. Uh, basically uh, uh, started Nouvelle Cuisine back in the 1970s, which was a huge thing for them. Uh, so this, it almost looks like a clover. Okay, it's not a very nice one. So you see it's green on the top. Right, green on the top, and then it's red on the bottom. Okay, and it's got a very, very astringent, uh, citrusy uh, flavor, not unlike the apple skin. It almost tastes just like green apple skin, but it grows in the wild. We pay about eighteen dollars a pound for this, uh, and it comes to us from uh, from uh, from Oregon. The best parts of the stem, actually. Okay, so we're just going to take a little bit of this wood sorrel, right, and we're just going to give it a really rough chop. Okay. Obviously, you need to wash it. It comes from the wild. Okay, you never know what's growing around in there. Even in, even in pristine areas, you have to wash your vegetables everywhere you go now. Like you cannot take any chances with that anymore. Who knows where it came from or where it's been? Or it just you, just just wash your vegetables. It's a good rule to live by now these days. All right. So just a rough chop on that. That goes into the vinaigrette right here. And then what we're gonna do really really quick is I'm gonna show you how we played at the restaurant. Okay. So we have our beautiful Riedel plates. Uh-oh. I'm getting the hook here. <laughs> the big cane's going to come around the corner and pull me off stage. He can come up, guys. <laughs> so what we're going to do, yeah, if you just want to start putting the, uh, the fish onto there, okay? I'm going to take uh, four pieces for me. Okay. Yeah, one piece per, okay? Hopefully we have enough for everybody. No, 
No, Hamachi is in the Jack family. Okay, Jack family, uh, Amberjack, right? Yellowtail, something you see around here locally. Uh, so for the plating, let me get my thing here. All right. And let me get my basil oil and basil seeds. I don't know if you guys stopped by our, our, our table yesterday, but we had uh, basil oil and basil seeds, which is one of my favorite garnishes in spring and summer. You guys ever worked with basil seeds before? No, you can get them from, uh, they're a Southeast Asian, um, you know, ingredient. My girlfriend's from Laos. She turned me on to them. Uh, they're pretty cool. Uh, so what we're going to do for this plate now to finish this up, all right, we're going to take the hamachi, going to lay it out. Normally, I would do it on a piece of paper just to show you exactly how we do it in the restaurant, okay? So that's going to go on a piece of paper. And hamachi, again, it's cut thick, right? But it's so soft and so fatty, it's going to melt right in your mouth, okay? So now I just take a little bit of olive oil, all right? I'll put it on the back of my spatula here, right? Put a little bit of Malden sea salt, which is a sea salt that comes from uh, London, or England. I shouldn't say London, England. Okay, nice and crunchy. Okay, we're gonna throw that on the plate. Okay, kind of all different shapes and sizes. I like to play it a little random. You know, I don't like everything so linear and tuck, 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 tuck. You know, like I like to have a little fun with it. Uh, we're gonna take a little bit of our vinaigrette. All right, we spoon that. over the fish, okay, with edamame, and you can see all the colors in there, right, with the wood sorrel, right, so it's nice and fresh, right, for spring and summer, I mean, if you had, if you threw that off, if you're at your, at your backyard barbecue or whatever, I mean, people are going to be talking about that for months, okay, since we have wood sorrel in the vinaigrette, right, we're going to take some wood sorrel, and we're going we're gonna to just throw a couple leaves on the plate, right, sorrel, sorrel, I don't believe in Garnishes that don't make sense. I don't believe in garnishes that really have nothing to do with it. You know, like I wouldn't put a piece of parsley on there because there's no parsley in it, right? If the dish, if the sauce was made from parsley, then of course I'd put parsley, right? All right, and then we just have a nice green oil uh, that's made, uh, like I said, basil seeds, basil oil, a little bit of basil in there, and that just kind of comes out and makes everything just pop on the dish like that, right? And then to finish it off, oh, 159, huh? All right, and then, right, we're just going to put a little bit of esplet chili, which is a chili that comes from the south of France, okay, and that's your real-time hamachi, okay? Thanks. Cool. Any questions before they kick me off the stage? I was the executive chef at the uh, Four Seasons Chicago. Yeah, before that, I was at uh, Mark Forgion, which is a Michelin star restaurant in Tribeca, New York. Yeah. Larry's son, exactly. We did a couple dinners with Larry. Yeah, he's a great guy. Him and uh, Johnny Waxman. Yeah, Waxman's a great guy, too. That's all the, kind of the same club there. So that's cool. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I think he's up at the at the uh, the CIA Greystone now, up in uh, Northern California. Yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. I love uh, I love Larry and the Forgione family. Really, really real people. Like uh, you know that that really that cook for real. You know, it's not a show. It's not for a book. It's not for anything else. They cook because they know it's right. Oh yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions before I boogie? Yeah. Uh, well, you don't have to buy the sharpest, you don't have to buy the most expensive knife in the world, right? Um, what I do is that I have whetstones, Japanese whetstones. Um, they're synthetic ones, and there's also ones uh, that are made, uh, that you can use oil. I like the water stones. If you go to that website, Corin, K-O-R-I-N, dot com, New York City, they'll have the whetstones, they'll have the Japanese blades, and they also have an instructional video from their knife master and how to sharpen knives properly. Okay, so if you buy, you know, like again, this was 600 bucks, but I bought this 12 years ago. Okay, I just sharpen it and sharpen it and sharpen it. And, you know, it's just like a car or a house or anything else. If you buy something nice, it's going to last. Okay, any other questions? No, we're good? All right, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you.